All right, let's keep going. All right, let's find a place. Watch I command the food and jump. It's amazing. Can we get the doors in the back? All right. So before the break, we talked about airway terminology. We had a set of terms that were the terms of disease. And the terms of disease were apnea, hypopnea. And we said that the apnea hypopnea index gives us a gradation of disease. While it may be off for a number of reasons, and we'll see a couple of those in a moment, that's what we use today. We also have the middle, middle set of terms, 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 terms of prevention. prevention. Basically, the, the disease is coming. Let's see what we could do to maybe avoid it and see if it's possible to intervene a little earlier. We also said that a lot of times that's not the world of the sleep position. The world of the sleep position typically is focused on fat old men with apnea, the low-hanging fruit, the one that they get paid for. The ones that are more sympathetic in nature tend to get reports back from the sleep position that says they're normal, when in fact they are symptomatic. Now we're going to look at a set of terms that focuses on how we get the numbers, how we screen some of the things that are going to be coming through your office. The first term is PSG, polysomnography. Polysomnography is a sleep study in a sleep laboratory. HST, home sleep test, is in many states, for example in Texas, it requires us to go through a home sleep test before we can send them to a laboratory for an examination. Now, there are exceptions to that, however, that's sort of the general rule. If you think your patient has apnea, we send them home with the device, they do it at home. If it shows something that would require further study, then you can justify doing an M lab test. Now, there are four different levels of testing. For you and I, we can't diagnose. So we don't, I mean, you could set up your own sleep lab in your office if you wanted to, but you can't do anything with the data as a dentist. You have to have a physician involved at that point in time. I also told you that my old strategy was find an apneic patient, send him to the sleep physician, and get a sleep study done immediately. Today, at least with children, I no longer do that as aggressively. I send them to the ENT and let the ENT manage the sleep physician part of it. Okay, adults, yes, find an apneic patient, send them to the sleep physician because they typically are going to be the apneic patient. But children, I was getting so many reports back that said, you don't have apnea, you're normal, that it prevented a lot of therapy in those kids. So today, I don't make that intervention anymore. I let the physician manage that part of it. So polysomnography, if you get a sleep study in a sleep laboratory, you're going to get a report back. And the report is going to have four things on it. Now, there'll be lots of things on the, on the report, but four main things that you're going to want to focus on. The first is, how long did it take you to fall asleep? So if you ask your patient, do you have difficulty falling asleep? If the answer is yes, the next question would be, on average, how long does it take for you to do that? If habitually it takes you longer than 30 minutes to fall asleep, that would be sleep onset insomnia. If you can fall asleep in less than seven, habitually, then you are either sleep deprived, that would be me, I've yet to see this year, no, I've seen one airplane take off this year. I'm like in the chair and I'm out. So I fall asleep really quickly. Or you have narcolepsy, hypersomnia. That would be the other explanation for being able to fall asleep so quickly. And we need to evaluate that possibly in a sleep laboratory. Now, what would you imagine one of the problems in being
lab and then looking at sleep. Right? So I went in for a sleep study at a sleep lab. I happened to have lectured the day before in Portland. And I got a red eye back to San Antonio. And usually when I land early in the morning like that, I go to sleep early afternoon and I go on with the day. That day I knew that in the evening, so I didn't go to sleep at all. By the time I got to the sleep lab, I might have been the only person ever excited to be there. Right? It was like, I can't wait to fall asleep. This is going to be awesome. Right? So they get so me they all get hooked up, up and I'm in the bed, bed and, and I lay down. down. The, first the first thing that thing happened, that happened and he's got stuff, stuff everywhere on it. The first thing that happened to me is I, the tube for the nasal cannula was running behind my ear and it was pinching my ear and crushing kind of against it. And in my head, I kept going, God, that hurts. And then I thought, it's making my ear fall asleep. I've never I've had my ear fall asleep. That's kind of a weird feeling. So I sat there. And finally, the technician came in and goes, you got a problem? And I said, yeah, this thing is hurting my ear. And he goes, move it. Like, oh. So I moved it. You know, but I got stuff on me. I thought, i got to lay still. So I moved it, and everything was better. I thought, well, that was silly, Jeff. You should have just moved the darn thing. Then I thought, how did he know there was a problem? I looked up in the corner, and there was this ball. He's watching me. I hope everything's tucked in. <laughs> this could be embarrassing. <laughs> And then I would start to fall asleep, and I go, and I go, oh, you know how you do sometimes, occasionally, you're like, oh, and I woke myself up, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm snoring. That's going to be embarrassing. He's going to watch me snore. I don't want to do that. Wait a second. That's why I'm here. <laughs> it was weird. It took me an hour and a half to fall asleep that night. An hour and a half. So it is a weird environment, and yet I think it's even more strange that we make such huge decisions about the patient and what treatment they sh we should render to them based on that one night, given that the first night effect of that study is really big. So we'll get, one, we'll get a study back, and it may have been the worst night in their entire life. There you go. We need to do based on that. So, what's the advantage of this home sleep test? At least you're at home, right? At least you got that part taken care of. Next thing they're going to ask you is as a patient, quality. And they're going to judge it. They're going to ask you about it as well. How, how, next is going to be how quickly did you fall asleep, sleep efficiency. Excuse me, not how fast you fell asleep, but how much of the time you were in bed were you asleep. And it would be nice to have about 90% of the night that you were actually asleep. Um, rarely does that actually happen. It's kind of the sort of the standard. And the last part is they're going to judge the arousal responses throughout the night and give you some numbers at the end of the night. Okay, so they'll give you an AHI, they'll give you the percentage of time. Said is a home sleep test, and I actually have one in my office. Uh, I've got this one that uh, DDME has. It's a uh, it's a home sleep test, and the only reason, to be honest with you, that I invested in it is I have this fascination for years with bruxism, and this would monitor bruxing it. First home sleep test device that came out with EMG leads that would monitor that. And, I, and so I invested in it because I just I have this little research project I'm doing in my office all the time, and I'm trying to get data, and this is the way that I did it forever. There is an easier way of getting that information, by the way, a pulse oximeter that can link in now, so you don't have to invest in it. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, if I today had to do it over again, I wouldn't buy this. I would, not this one. I'm not talking about this product, I'm talking in general. 
I don't think dentists need home sleep devices unless your real focus is doing sleep dentistry. If you want to be a dentist focused on airway, you need screening devices. You don't need full-blown send them home with this thing. This is expensive, it's got disposable costs. You're probably going to, if you have one, you want to bill it to medical. And, and there are problems, there are problems with, that. with that. If you get a you lousy, lousy test, test and, and you know, send it out to a sleep laboratory and they go, yeah, I think they really need to run a sleep study, they have to then justify why another study, study, study after you just got paid out of medical. medical. And, and plus you're kind of taking money from the, the sleep physician down the road. It's kind of like when I stopped doing endo, I just gave the endodontist all of them. I didn't cherry pick the anterior teeth because they got a better relationship that way by giving them some of the easy ones, right? So that's my, the idea. When would I own this? I would own this if I lived in Halifax. I was in Halifax lecturing. There's a two-year waiting list to get a sleep study done. So I'm, I might have one now that I could use on my patients. Uh, I would have one if I was a friend of mine that lives in, um, in Wisconsin. He lives in a town where there's one sleep physician with one sleep laboratory and the guy's a jerk. I would totally buy one of these. And I would honestly give it out free to anyone that wanted to have it just to put that guy out of business. So, I would. So, in certain situations it makes sense. Or, once again, if, you're whole, if you want to focus your practice on doing traditional sleep dentistry, then it, would, you know, it may be worth it in that particular case as well. All right, so that's the reason I bought it, though. I just was interested in the idea of bruxing and clinching and how it relates to the airway. So, as I said, first night effect is a problem. Cost is an issue. Cost, by the way, is a big issue. You start saying, like, every kid that walks in that you think has an airway issue, you go, well, you need sleep study, you need sleep study. Um, I was dealing with some parents in Virginia. The sleep study was 2,500 bucks. Where are you going to come up with an extra 2,500 bucks? to get a piece of information that you may or may not use. And a lot of times you don't use. So I'm leaving that part up to the physician to make those decisions for me. And I'm not, I wouldn't urge you in this course, I'm not urging you to go out and buy this type of equipment. I think you need more of the screening type of equipment. What other problem does the sleep study have? Well, who are they trying to find? Fat old, old men, right? right? What do fat, what old, do fat men old men have? Big levels, Big levels of apnea. Yes? Yes. Okay. okay. What kind what of kind scoring of do, they do they do? Remember, Remember there are two, two different, different scoring, scoring systems, systems that are out there, there and one, one of them is, is bigger, bigger events, events than the other, than the other one. one. And so, so they did a study where they went into, and this is a heart health study. It's kind of like a you know, gorillas in the mist kind of thing, right? So all they do is go in, do a bunch of tests on 6,400 people, then they watch them over time. And they go, oh, that one died. And then they go, oh, I wonder why. And they backtrack and go, oh, they had apnea. And then they could go, maybe apnea caused the heart attack, right? So that's the idea behind the study, is get as much data as you can and then figure out down the road why people got sick or why people died. So in so this, this study, study 6,400 6, sleep studies got done. If they, if they graded, graded the sleep, sleep studies by using the 1B definition, definition, the 4% desaturation, desaturation for hypopnea, hypopnea you'll, get you'll get one level, level of health. health. And if you use the 1A definition, definition which physicians, physicians recommend, 3% desaturation, desaturation or arousal, arousal, you get a different, different level of health. health. In fact, if you use Medicare's definition, 4% for hypopnea, about 50% of the patients, 47.9% of the patients are seen as normal. If you go to the physician recommended definition, normal is only 17% of the people. Meaning there's a 30% difference in what is seen as normal in simply how you define hypopnea. Now think about the impact of that. If you have a patient that you think is symptomatic because of airway and you send them to the physician down the road and they use the medical definition of 4%, a lot of times you're getting a report back that says, no, they're normal, when in fact they're not. 
when in fact they have symptoms, it's just a scoring, let's call it error, for the moment. Why, when you look at these statistics, given that there's a 30% difference, why do you think Medicare chooses 4%? They, they don't have to pay, right? 30% more people would require payment to get treatment done. So they just accept a definition that was created in 2007, well before we started looking at what the M true impact is. In this study, think of the impact. Patient dies, you look at the sleep study, did they have an airway problem? If you use 4%, the answer half the time is nope, they didn't. But if you use 3% or an arousal, it's only 17% of the time that you would say, nope, they didn't. They otherwise did. I'll give you a more personal example, and these keep coming up all the time now. Can't tell you how many times I have now sent people to a different laboratory to get a study graded in the 1A standard, and it's changed their lives. So, give you an example of an attorney in, in the Air Force who has a long history of what he thinks are, are sleep issues. It mainly revolves around the fact that he's not getting promotions because every time he gets a promotion, they have to do like an assessment of him, and the assessment always would say, you know, he's, he's lazy, he's not dedicated, he didn't put in the extra effort, all those things. And he keeps saying, it's a sleep issue. I am exhausted. I'm trying my best, but I'm exhausted. He's known it for years or told them for years. He said his whole life he's had multiple awakenings all night long, his sleep is not restorative, and he told me that his mouth is always dry when he wakes up, which tells me what? He's breathing through his mouth rather than his nose at night. His history at working through this sleep now three, he complained about grinding his teeth. Now, tomorrow we're going to talk about that could have been an early sign that he's trying to keep his airway open. Our answer as dentist is to make a splint. In this case, the splint did not improve him. In fact, it made him worse. Second thing they did is he said, you know, this is, I'm getting worse now with the splint. I'm not going to wear that anymore. I need a real sleep study. In 2004, they did that real sleep study and said, no, you're fine. In 2008, they do it again and said, no, you're fine. But here, why don't you take some medication to get you to sleep, which just made him more groggy all day long. In 2013, he's in Cutter. He goes through the whole thing again, working with a sleep psychiatrist and a uh, psychologist, uh, psychologist, and they said, you know, you're fine. fine. Everything is okay. okay. You don't have an issue. In 2016, he's so stressed out by his inability to sleep that he ended up hospitalizing himself voluntarily for all the stress. He's tried medication. He's tried everything. He said, all I want is a diagnosis. They keep telling me I'm normal, but I just, I know I'm not. Okay? So there are two things in, if you have this situation come up that you want to do. One of them is you want your laboratory that you're sending your patient to to score it according to the 1A standard, which is that hypopnea is defined as a 30 to 90% reduction in airflow, 10 seconds long, a 3% desaturation or an arousal. Now, they may tell you, hey, their insurance is going to require it to be scored differently, and that's fine. They can score it both ways. You just want the information the way that the physician task force recommends that it be done, rather than Medicaid. The second thing that you would love to do is for them to measure the rearas more efficiently and effectively. And the way that that is done is by using a device called PEZ. PEZ, big P, little ES, it's on your sheet. Big P, pressure, ES, is
They sent patients out that had reflux. They put a tube up their nose all the way down to their stomach, and they monitor it for 24 to 48 hours. That's esophageal manometry. If you stop it mid-thorax and measure the negative pressure in the esophagus, that will tell you what's going on in the oral pharynx. So it's the best way to find negative pressure changes in the airway. So that's what I did. I sent him to a lab to do that. Now, where are you going to find that? Very few places. Where are you? Richmond, Virginia. You ain't finding it. Not happening. Okay? It's in, you can find it in, you can find it in Ann Arbor. You can find it in Houston, Austin. San Jose, California at Stanford is really where it all originated. And so you can find some people around there to do it as well. The typical person that's going to do it was Stanford-trained sleep physicians, because they learned to utilize it, and many of them have continued that. Remember the guy, Krakow, that was telling us a lot of interesting things about it? Guess how he learned those things? He used PEZ. Remember Chervin told us about ADHD kids and which ones are going to do better? How did he learn all that? Because he used PEZ, esophageal manometry, to find these ultimate small events. All right, All right, so the guy, the guy goes, goes in. in. We're, we're measuring, measuring the smallest of small events, and we're going to score it according to the physician's guidelines. guidelines. So, so that's, that's what they what did, and that's what they're what telling they're us here. Telling if, if they scored, they scored him, him according, according to the 1B, one B, which is the Medicare guideline, guideline finding, finding every, every event, event they could find, find right? So they're measuring it as good as anybody can do it and they're and scoring, scoring according to the Medicare, Medicare standard, standard. their apnea, apnea level is 4.2. So the study, the study would be what? what? You're normal. Because remember, remember AHIs, AHIs at 5 to 15 are when you start to call them myo. Yes? yes? So, so we are now, now doing, doing the, the finest, finest sleep study you, you can possibly do, do. And we're and measuring according to the Medicare, Medicare guidelines, guidelines, it would it be would normal. normal. But the, the moment you use the physician task, task force guidelines, guidelines he has he's got, got a moderate, moderate level of apnea. His RDI is 20.3. 20. 20. And in fact, and the physician's conclusion is, is oh, by the way, during, during REM, REM, it went up to 40 events per hour. His conclusion is he absolutely has fragmented sleep because of his obstructive respirations and treatment is indicated. Now when he's treated, they actually put him on CPAP. He was a person that was very compliant with CPAP. Why? Because he's had this 10 or 15 year history, in fact a lifetime, of not being able to breathe. He was all in. If anything that was going to make him better, and sure enough, he comes into the office and said, you know, I'm a different person now. I just needed somebody. So, so, see the see difference? The difference? So, in so in Richmond, you're not going to get PEZs. PEZ. But what you could get is them scoring it according to the 1A guidelines. That's what you really want to ask your physician. Now, what about in kids? Well, in kids, in fact, it magnifies because they're so good at fixing their airway. You see, the last guy was having a bunch of littler events, and we weren't able to really score those. Well, on top, on top of having, of having little, little events, events that were unscorable, remember half of the events in kids didn't even have an arousal. So, so the people at Stanford, Stanford once again said, we're, we're seeing symptomatic kids, kids that are just that are having just effortful breathing. breathing. So a so better, better scoring system isn't waiting around for them to have apnea. Yeah. A better scoring yeah. system yeah. is to find inspiratory flow limited breathing events and once those reach a certain level we're going to call that an event so that's what they did they said here's a better scoring system for children as opposed to the one proposed by the american academy of sleep medicine now how are they going to test it it's an interesting study it's a two-part study first part is they're going to go find kids in the area that had already had sleep studies done so over 200 kids were sent in to get sleep studies done why would a physician by the way send a kid in to get a sleep study i mean they're not rarely is it well i think you have you know you have hypertension and therefore i mean that's they can but that's pretty rare what is it usual it could, it could be that be the, the parents, parents say, I've watched them not breathe. breathe. That would be a reason. 
It could be that they're not growing. It could be that they're still bedwetting late in life. It could, right? So all these other factors, or it could be that they have ADHD, and the physician is in tune enough to say, I think that might be a sleep issue. So under, over 200 kids were sent in to get sleep studies done. The physicians on some of them were already medicating them, but usually what they were doing is waiting around to see what the sleep study showed before they made a decision. Now, once again, let's pretend that you're a sleep, uh, that you're a physician. You send a kid in to get a sleep study done. You're waiting to hold, withhold medication for attention deficit. The study comes back and says they don't have a sleep issue. What do you do? You medicate them, right? Okay, so you see where we're going with all this. Well, well, the group, the group at Stanford, Stanford established their guidelines, how they were going to use PEZ and how they were going to score those, those kids. 200 kids were involved in the project. They were all different ages of them. of them. None of them were overweight. 135 of the patients had already received medications. Others were uh, the sleep study back before they decided on medications. All of the kids had some anatomic risk factor. If you scored the sleep studies on these kids with the American Academy of Sleep Medicine guidelines, what it said is only 19% of the kids had an airway issue. Which would mean what? Once again, pretend you're a physician for a moment. You sent your ch the children in. Only 19 come back that say there's an airway issue, in which case you would address the airway issue. But the other ones, you would do what? Medicaid. Okay. The next is, and which is what it says, the next was we're going to score it differently. We're going to score it according to the Stanford guidelines, and the Stanford guidelines, the answer was, I think 99% of the kids have an error. Now that's a little different. 19 or 99, that's kind of the difference between here and Paris. So it's a big difference. So they did part two of the study. Part two would be, if we honestly believe they have an airway issue, then what would the treatment be? It wouldn't be medication, would it? It would be fix the airway problem. So that's what they did. They got 99 of the kids to come back and sleep in this study. They treated them with CPAP. They treated them with um, tonsil and adenoid removal. They recommended orthodontics on a fair number of them, but hadn't gotten to do the orthodontics yet on any of them when they ran the new testing on them. What they found is their apnea levels were coming under control, but to be honest with you, they weren't that much better. They were still pretty symptomatic. But if you look at the number of kids that were medicated beforehand, 43 of the 99 came in on meds, continued the medication after they addressed their airway issue. And I would bet that those five were the groups that still really didn't have the airway resolved completely and didn't close their mouth and breathe through their nose. We'll see how important that is a little later on. Okay, so, so children, children suffer, suffer from the same problem of scoring. scoring. If, you if you wait around, around as I said earlier, for the kid to be a bad apnea kid, kid, to go, okay, now they have apnea, let's, let's treat them, them. You're, you're, you're way, way too far down the road. Right. Does anyone, anyone doubt this doubt child has an airway issue? issue? I mean, he breathes through his mouth, he has allergic shiners, he has bilateral crossbite, he's got an underbite. He has attention deficit already di diagnosed. He's a mouth breather all the time. He's not growing. Uh, he's got big tonsils. He got pretty much you just make a list of all the things you're looking for, and you found it all in one kid. So in the day, right, when I started learning about this, these kids walk into practice. I treated them the way I did my sleep dentistry patients, see a person evaluate the person and go, oh, of course you have apnea. Let's go to the sleep physician because I didn't have a screening tool at the moment that would work on kids. You see, high-resolution pulse oximeters are difficult for kids to wear, especially kids, and they don't desaturate that much, so I have not found them helpful as a screening tool. I just looked at everything and went, oh, yeah, you got sleep. That's a, that's a problem. I sent him in to get a sleep study done. His AHI was... Zero. Zero. <laughs> now he had a lot of arousals. He didn't have very much REM sleep. Fragmented throughout the entire night. But at the end of the day, what did we get? We got nasal spray. We got reevaluation. We got no additional follow up. And in fact, I see the mom every so often, every few years, as just as a social acquaintance. 
and he never did really get treated. Why? I think it's because I sent him into the sleep study first. You see, when it, you go now to the ENT with a sleep study that says the AHI is zero, what does the ENT do? Yeah, the tonsils are big, but obviously they're not having any problem. They'll grow out of it. Whereas if I do it the other way, and they look at the anatomy and listen to the story first, then it creates activity and action more than the other way around. So I have found sleep studies to block action on kids rather than promote action. Same with ortho. The orthodontist in the pat, you know, you go, okay, why don't we expand and take care of the bite and all the rest? Well, they're really not having a sleep issue. Why don't we wait until the molar comes in, whatever. They, they delay it. So, so I, I just, just let the let ENT be in charge of that. I want everyone else to listen to the story. And for the dental part of it, I just want to do dentistry. Give you an example on an adult. This is a, a friend of mine who's a dentist in Salt Lake. And Ron came in and needed a rehabilitation redone. But his chief complaint on the chart was, I'm exhausted. Can't remember the last time I felt good. So this is Ron. And Ron has, is a half tooth, class two, you're going to see in a moment. Ron had a bunch of dentistry that was done about 17 years ago that has been failing the entire time. And when you go back historically and look at it, it could have been an airway problem to begin with, and the airway problem stayed with Ron, therefore he continued to damage the dentistry that was done, even though it was done quite well. When you ask Ron what his symptoms are, and he gives you a list of them, he sounds like a young fit female. Right? I have, I'm exhausted. Exhaustion isn't a complaint of an old fat man. In fact, old fat men are the hardest ones to talk to. You ever done that? I think you may have a sleep problem. How do you sleep? I sleep great. What do you mean you sleep great? I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I go to sleep, I wake up. I sleep great. You know, really, you go to sleep and then you wake up. Yeah. Well, I get up four or five times to pee, but I got this prostate problem. Well, no, you don't. What happens in the middle of the night is you have a huge abdomen. And then you go, I will never get to sleep unless I go pee. Right? That's how it happens. And the other question you want to go is, well, how's your wife sleep? She can't sleep. Why? Because I snore. How loud? It's historic. <laughs> and it's amazing. They're really hard to talk to. And so I have to, if I can get them to wear a device, then I can show them, hey, look, the numbers look like they're off, and you probably ought to follow up on this, right? So you got to figure out a way to get them to screen themselves. But they don't complain about, oh, I'm so exhausted, I'm worn out, I'm fatigued. What, what do they do? They fall asleep. And by the way, just, you know, I know y'all have the softest, gentlest, kindest touch in the whole world. I get it. But if you're drilling on someone's tooth and they fall asleep and start closing on your handpiece, it's not you. They got at me, okay? I, you know, just get over it. Oh, I'm so gentle. No! <laughs> it's not. Who's the easiest person to talk to? Young fit females. How do you sleep? If you ask them that question, you better be ready for a story. Because it, it's like, how do you sleep? And then 20 minutes later, they breathe where you can get another question in there. So, I mean, they're blah, 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 blah. My husband and da 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 blah. Right? right? He goes on and on and on. And the complaint is fatigue, worn out, exhausted. Right? That's what Ron was complaining about. But Ron doesn't look like a young fit female, does he? No. He's complaining about body aches and IBS and, and weight. I mean, these are young fit female complaints. And I was confused. Now, Ron's medical history, that's more fat old man. And when we did a, when the sleep study was done on him, his apnea level was 55. The interesting thing was he only had one apneic event the whole night. The rest were hypopneic. So he was constantly trying to fix his airway. 
That's where the young female symptoms came in because of the effort. Old fat men that have big time apnea, they don't try at all sometimes. They just sit there. One third of the fat old men with apnea, their tongue won't even activate during an apneic event. It'll just sit there and lay in the airway. Finally, the brain goes, you better breathe, you know, and they take a breath. So Ron's at least making an effort. Ron broke his nose multiple times playing basketball and it was repaired, but he still can't breathe well through the left side of his nose. He's been on CPAP for the past 12 years and every year, Ron, interestingly, unlike most patients, Ron goes back and checks with his physician every year. And every year he says the same thing, this isn't working. And every year he gets some new thing, right? We need to try a different machine. We need a different mask. We need medication, which just made him more groggy and sleepy and didn't fix it. So he's not getting any better, right? And unfortunately, that's the story for many people on CPAP. Why? Because it fixes the apnea, but it creates what? It creates inspiratory flow limiter breathing events. It creates activity. It creates sympathetic activity. So the body is exhausted now rather than being sleepy. They don't feel any better at the end of the night. Now, Ron's a dentist. He made himself five oral appliances, all of which on day three, his bite got stuck forward and it took him six weeks to get his bite back. All right? So there's the, some of the breakage. You can see he's a half tooth class two. Ron has a tongue tie. Ron has big tori. We'll talk about those as we go through. I also told you that I had an ENT in the office. And so I was able to scope him right away when he came in. There is no grading system, by the way, for uvulas. So I just honestly, on this one, I went, I looked at my, my assistant goes, uvula. And I went, big toe. Because <laughs> it's big. Look at this bad boy. Right? That was pretty darn big. Now here's the funniest part of the whole deal. Think about what you have to do with anything that goes in the mouth and how safe you have to be. ENTs put it, the thing in your mouth and then they go, here, we'll jam it up your nose now. So I always felt that was kind of a weird thing to go directly into his nose after that. The left side of his nose is shut off. So we go in and there's a small little hole and then there's a big scar and another little hole. That ought to be one big hole, right? So, Ron can't breathe through the left side of his nose. At the end of the exam, he said, wouldn't they want to know that? What was, who was he referencing? His physician, right? Wouldn't they want to know that I can't breathe through my nose and I have a uvula the size of a big toe and a bunch of tissue back there, right? Wouldn't they want to know that? Instead of every year giving me a different mask, trying medication, wouldn't they want to know that there are anatomic issues? Yeah, I think so. Here's my question to you. Wouldn't you want to know it? Because if the reason that he's breaking his ceramic or the reason before the ceramic was done that he wore out his teeth was he can't breathe when he's eating and he postures forward as well, wouldn't you want to know that? Wouldn't that be important in protecting your work or keeping him as a child from ever having these issues? Yeah. I would think it's important to know these airway pieces of information along the way. So what did we do? We controlled it with BiPAP because that was what he was on at the moment. We said, just stay on that. It's, you know, I know it's not doing great, but at least it's got it under control to the best degree it can. Then we said, Ron, here's the deal. You need to not be on that anymore, right? You need to to get off. get off. You need you to need fix to these anatomic, anatomic issues. issues. What, what were some of the anatomic issues you just saw? Can't, can't breathe through the left side of his nose. nose. Got, got too much, much tissue in the, in the, the roof. You need, you need to fix that. But honestly, Ron, Ron your mandible, mandible and maxilla are in the wrong place, place in the world. world. You need two jaw two surgery. surgery. You need you maximal mandibular advancement. To which he said, I'm 63 or four years old. Aren't I going to be numb? And I said, yes, you will. I'll almost, almost guarantee, guarantee it. it. I just I don't just know if it's one, one side or both sides, sides, but you're gonna, gonna be numb. numb. But here's the cool here's thing, Ron. Ron. You'll, You'll be alive, alive to experience, experience the numbness, numbness this way. way. 
So we said, first thing we got to do is clear things up. Got to breathe through your nose. Got to get that tissue out of the roof of your mouth. Now, the newer literature for the surgeons that are in the room, they'll tell you that the new literature tells us if we cut away the palate and then we do maximal mandibular advancement in the future, you actually make the advancement less likely to fix the apnea. So taking normal away first is not the thing to do if you're doing maximal mandibular advancement, if that's your plan. Yet, was Ron's tissue in the back of his throat normal? No. So we got to get that taken care of. So that's what we did. First step, took it away. Two weeks later, when he was still really swollen, he screened himself. His AHI is three now. His RDI was eight. He just had a recent sleep study done. He's actually had multiples just to check it. The worst is he ever had was 10, an AHI of 10. So does Ron need maximum mandibular advancement? I mean, if his ultimate goal is to get rid of those 10, I guess, but I think that's silly at this point. We call it a day. So what are we going to do for his rehabilitation? Remember, the top line says airway. Do you have an airway problem? Do you not? If you say to me, he's got an airway problem, then I'm going to need to do some bigger intervention. Yes? I'm going to say no, which means I'm just doing dentistry. Put the teeth in the right place, get the function in the right place. Now, Ron, by the way, will in the workshop, we'll look at his case in a little more depth. But Ron has displaced discs and condyles that are set down and back, which means when he tells us when I wear the appliance, I get stuck on my front teeth, and it takes me six weeks to get my bite back, what he's really saying is, I get in a normal position for my jaw joint. I'm in a seated condylar position when my teeth are in on. It takes me six weeks to dislocate my disc enough to get my back teeth in place. So what we're doing is working to that forward position, deprogramming there, and then doing the orthodontics and final restorations in that position. All right. So. Hopefully you're starting to see where this plays a role and that in fact sleep studies are important, sleep positions are important, but I'm working my way through the physician to get that information rather than going directly anymore. As a dentist, I just need screening tools and I said I think apps are probably where we're headed, but I actually have two different kinds of screening tools in my office. The first is high resolution. Oximeters, high resolution pulse oximeters. The pulse oximeters will hold upwards of five nights of data. So if you happen to send it home with someone, if I said, you know what, it looks like in your mouth what I'm seeing might be related to some airway issues. Would you mind you know, wearing this thing? It's, it's like the size of a wristwatch. It goes on your finger. It's no big deal. I don't charge anything for it. Would you do it for a couple nights? Oh, by the way, tell me about the rest of your family. Anybody else have these types of issues. Because if I can get you to screen your son-in-law and your next-door neighbor, and, right? I mean, think of the marketing possibilities. Because really, marketing is about getting people in your door, right? To see your practice, to experience something different than anyone else has. I get a ton of people walking in that have never been in my practice just to talk about their airway. And then I go, oh, do you have a dentist? Or are you interested? I don't know. I'm, I'm okay with doing that. Works for me. For the purposes of the seminar, I'm going to go through how to read the pulse oximeter report that I use, but any of them are fine, right? They're all, they're all okay. Uh, in the workshop, we go through a couple of different varieties that I use. And as I said, if they, if they have an app, that's cool. If they've got a Fitbit, that's, that'll work. If they have an Apple Watch, that'll work. Anything works. Because really, all you need is something that says yay or nay. You're sleeping well, you're not sleeping well. I think some of them are better than others. Uh, I don't understand a lot of them. I, 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 invariably, I'll be walking around, and I'll, I'll be out in the, in the area here having a glass of water, walk up my phone, go. Well, look. Go, yeah. Wow. I have no idea what I'm looking at. And the new ones are like all color coded and bars and graphs and all kinds of fancy stuff. Like, wow. 
What's that What's telling, telling you? Ah, uh, it tells me I sleep really bad. That's what it's telling me, too. That's really all it's for, right? And then when you do something, you do it again, right? You screen yourself again, you go, look, it's better. And like, ah. So that's all it really is for us. Create activity, then give us the ability to tight track. If you got it on your, on your phone, then you can do it all the time, right? Like, I'm gonna, I love doing little experiments. Like, all right, tonight, let's irrigate your nose and use Flonase. And then uh, do two nights of that, and then the next night, we're going to use irrigation, Flonase, and a nasal dial. Oh, look, it made it better, you know? I love doing that kind of stuff. So that gives us the option, a very affordable way of, of doing it. Okay? All right, so for my pulse oximeter, there are only there are four only things four you're going to look at. So when I pop up, up a picture of uh, here's what we did before and after kind of thing, you'll be familiar with that. The first, the first thing we're going to look at is the left side of the screen. That's the RDI. RDI, remember, that's the combination of apnea, hypopnea, and rearies. The way they break it out, in this case, the RDI is 41. The right side of that column says 33. That's the number of apneic and hypopneic events. And the left side is the number of rearers. That would be eight. Now, remember I said earlier that the number may be misleading? Because if you have a low number that are really bad events, that's probably worse than a high number of little events. Well, this pulse oximetry, the algorithm actually has a thing called the cycling severity index. Cycling severity index is trying to figure out for you how bad is it. It looks at, on average, how long are the desaturations, how deep are the desaturations, are you cycling, meaning is it you're not being able to get out of the desaturations as they're occurring, and how much spacing is there between each event. In other words, if all nine events in the hour occur right on top of each other, that's worse than if you spread them out throughout the entire hour. So, so the, the report, report may show, show, oh, it's only 10 events, but the 10 events can be got off, right? In which case you would call them more severe. Now you and I, we can't call them severe, right? So keep in mind that we can't say, it looks like you have severe sleep apnea. You would say to the patient, people that have these have been found to have, or some little nuanced deal, right? I'm worried that you may have. I think you ought to get this checked out. Because if you say to them you have severe sleep apnea, these numbers indicate you have severe sleep apnea, you're diagnosed. Now it's kind of silly, right? Because if you make a blood pressure on a person and it's 200 over 120, what do you say to them? You have high blood pressure. You don't go, and this is indicating that you may possibly could have, might have, have sort of, sort of sounds, sounds like high blood pressure, right? right? You say, say you got high blood pressure, blood pressure which is a diagnosis, diagnosis right? right? But you're not you're licensed not to diagnose, diagnose that, are you? Are you? But, nobody but nobody gets in trouble for that. For that. Because, because the next thing out of your mouth, mouth is, and you and need to go see your physician, physician about this, about right? right? Well, if you look at this and go, uh, you, you know, you got severe sleep apnea, I think you need to what? See a physician about this. Unfortunately, sleep physicians have their panties in a wad, so don't say that. Just say, it appears that you may have sleep apnea. I think you need to see your physician, all right? Get them to the physician. Your requirement is to make that referral. So, so you need to you not need say not it, say and your staff needs to not, not write down, down, you know, be sitting there typing. You told me it's fear sleep apnea. No, no. it said, said they possibly could have apnea, and, and they need to go to the physician. physician. I'll be happy to send this report to them. All right? right? So, so please, please be careful of the semantics here, because in some contentions at the moment. All right? right? Next thing is hypoventilation. Why is that important to know? Because people that hypoventilate typically are obese. They lay on their back, they can't quite take a deep breath. So the pulse oximeter is going to be monitoring the baseline saturation when they lay down and are, they are awake. So it's what, when they lay down to go to sleep and breathe the air in the room, what is their oxygenation? 
and then it's going to watch as they hypoventilate themselves. They don't take a deep breath, and they go all the way down, in this case, to 73. Now, it's important because a traditional pulse oximeter would register that as being a big old apneic event. But it's different because hypoventilation cannot be fixed by making them an oral appliance. Got to lose weight, got to put them on CPAP, got to get them off their back, something like that. But you can jut their jaw all the way out of their head and you're not fixing this. And if it's called apnea on your recorder, then you're thinking that you're missing it. You know, maybe if I just dial you another millimeter. No, that ain't gonna do. And the last one is what we call page three because it's page three. And it's a culmination of the entire night's sleep. The top line is the desaturations. The bottom green is the pulse rate. And you can start looking at events throughout the evening. So as they desaturate, how the pulse actually responds to them. All right, so who do I use that on? I use it on fat old men that have apnea. Why? Because fat old men that have apnea will wear it. That's one reason. The second reason is, that's all I want. I want a number. You know, I think you got apnea. Let's just find out a number. And then when you visit with them, it's easy. This is telling me that you may have sleep apnea. I think you need to go follow up with your physician on that. It doesn't stop me from doing dentistry, by the way. It just says you need to go have a physician help you with your apnea. I'm going to help you with what? I'm going to help you with the wear on your teeth and the bruxism and the erosion. I'm going to just do dentistry. So they'll take care of your apnea. I'll take care of your dentistry. And if my plan for doing your dentistry makes your airway better, bonus. But physician takes care of your apnea. I'm just doing dentistry. You know, the other thing that you can do is as you're working through doing their dentistry, be it making a night guard all the way up to doing a rehabilitation in an open vertical dimension, you can titrate them. Here, take the pulse ox home. Let me see how you're doing again. Now you can compare the data. All right? The problem that I have with the pulse oximeter is, you see the bottom line? That's the pulse. You see that? There's very little desaturation, but the pulse rate is going crazy all night long. They're very sympathetically active. Yet, the number doesn't really give me an impact, does it? Because they won't desaturate. So the number is like an AHI of three. And you go, yeah, but you're sim you got symptoms. I think you got a sleep problem. It's three. I want to know what all that activity is all about, right? I want to know about the sympathetic activation that's occurring all night long. That seems to be very important. So I noticed when I was talking about waking up at 310 and all the UARS, young fit female symptoms, there was a whole bunch of people in the audience looking at each other and talking to their neighbors and all the rest. So all of you that were thinking, that's me, I want you to think with me. If I have talked to you in my office and at the end of the discussion I said, I think we need to do some sort of screening on you. And the screening I recommended is a thing that's about the size of a big old wristwatch, and it goes down and squeezes on your finger just so you can kind of feel your pulse in your finger all night long. And it sort of makes it feel kind of numb a little bit. What are the odds you're going to wear that? In fact, it's almost diagnostic. I send it home with you, you turn it on, you turn it off 15 minutes later and hand it back to me. My UARS patients are disturbed by everything. It has to be cold in the room. It has to be perfectly dark in the room. They can tell, like Princess in the Pea, whether it's their pillow or their husband's pillow. Right? Mercury has to be in retrograde to Jupiter. I mean, everything has to be perfect for them to go to sleep and stay asleep. And I'm asking them to wear something the size of a wristwatch. They can't even wear their wedding ring to bed, much less something that's going to squeeze on their finger. So we had to find something that measured and gave us the impact of the sympathetic activity, which a pulse oximeter doesn't 
and was something that my young Fifimo would wear. And so the device we recommend is called Cardio Pulmonary Coupling. It's from a company called Sleep Image. It is a single line EKG. It measures heart rate variability and it, it uh, uh, from an algorithm, finds respiratory patterns as well, hence the cardiopulmonary part of it. It's going to tell you if you're sympathetically active or if you're getting the benefit of being asleep. The nice thing about it is, well, there are a few nice things. The first is it's approved for children all the way down to six months of age. So the FDA has cleared this for all the way down there because, I mean, a pulse oximeter on a kid, you know, Jake was really good at wearing everything. He loved, like, being part of the experiment. And I could never get a pulse ox to stay on all night long because what does he do? He wanders around the bed all night long. Jake was horrible to sleep with. I hated sleeping with him. In fact, I hated sleeping with him up until a few years ago. Like, one time I was sleeping with him in a hotel bedroom. My dad was in the next bed over, so we had those stupid, what they call as a queen, but that was like the smallest queen I've ever seen. And so I've got a big kid sleeping next to me, and all night long he's just banging into me. Y'all have a kid like that? Like, whap! And I'm like, bam! Then I shove him. And then, bam! And it'd be a leg that time. And I mean, I was just... And one time, finally, I mean, I told you, one time he whacked me across the face, which hurts, right? And so I shoved him really hard that time because I was kind of pissed, and he went and flopped off the bed. He stayed asleep. I left him there. He's <laughs> like, he's okay. He'll be all right. I finally could sleep. I was you know, it's good. So... If you put that on them, it moves all over the place. It's just hard to use. This, put it on, you get them to wear like an Under Armour kind of shirt, something that's tight against them and holds it in place. Kids that move, it still can tear free because kids that move tend to sweat also. They're sympathetically active, they sweat more. Because of that, it'll move sometimes. So, you know, there are signal problems. And a lot of times we'll send it home for a couple of nights, we get it back, the signal isn't any good on, on them, and we have to try it again until we get a good signal all night long. On young fit females, it tends to work. Once again, we ask them just put a t-shirt on, go to sleep. The young fit females that it typically has problems with are people that like to sleep on their chest. So if you like to lay on your chest, then you're gonna feel the pad, and they don't like it as much but I get better data than I have in the past. So let me kind of play this game with you. This is the picture that I put up without the words. I put this photo up on anyone that comes in for me to explain what we're trying to record, okay? So if you came into the office and I had run a cardiopulmonary coupling on you, I would, on a screen in the office, I would pull this picture up. And I would say, here's what's going on. At the very beginning of the night, down in the lower left-hand corner, you can see a little, like a mountain, right? That's dark gray. You are awake right there. Then you fell asleep, and all the white area is stable sleep. Stable sleep, so parasympathetic sleep. Now, do you see that there are small peaks and tall peaks? The taller the peak, the more your breathing and heart rate are in sync with one another. So taller peak, better sleep. Each vertical line is an hour. So you can tell for almost an hour you were getting great sleep. Then you cycled out into the dark gray at the bottom. The dark gray right at the very bottom of the whole thing, that is either the frequency that REM sleep occurs at or the frequency that when you're awake is happening. So how can we possibly tell the difference if they happen at the same frequency? And by the way, your mind is more active during REM sleep than when you're awake. So there's a lot of activity going on. How do you know the difference? And the answer is in REM sleep, you do not move. So if the Hertz frequency 
is REM or awake, then the actigraphy, the movement, if it's not moving, we know that's a dream. So what did you do? What did this person do? They were awake, they fell asleep, they got great sleep, they went into a dream. They then went back into what? Really good quality sleep, yes? How long did it last? Long time. What was happening? In the middle. They kind of had a little break, they had a little awakening, then when they went back to sleep. You see that? Then they cycle out into a dream. What happens later in the night? More dreams, less deep sleep. Everyone okay with that? Less stable sleep, I guess. Everybody good? All right. So... What I would what do I would is do go is over go that with a patient. So if you were my patient, I go, does that, does that kind of make sense to you now as to what we're looking for? This obviously, this, is, this one isn't yours. This was somebody that I think had a pretty darn good night's sleep. All right, so here's your night's sleep. Now you smiled even though that wasn't your night's sleep, but you felt it, right? And everyone's kind of going, oh, that's the reaction you get from a patient. Now there is a ton of information that this gathers. In fact, it gathers every heartbeat the entire night. All right, so there's a ton of information about movement, about snoring, um, about stable and unstable sleep, all the rest, but at its core, as far as communication with patients, it's pretty darn simple. This is what you want, this is what you're doing. Here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna do this, this, and this, and then we'll do it again. And then when we finally see it start to look like what we would consider more normal, we know we're making progress. Okay? So that's how the device is used. What does it look like? The printout, the printout actually has four different wheels here at the front. SQI sleep, sleep quality index, which is basically how much deep, how much stable to unstable sleep did you have throughout the evening. We know an adult you need basically two times the amount of stable to unstable or parasympathetic to sympathetic, and a child four to one ratio is more normal. Um, the software automatically will grade it according to pediatric or adult scales based on the date of birth that you put in. Some other terms that you need to be aware of, um, high frequency is stable sleep, low frequency is unstable sleep, low frequency events could be an apneic event. And in fact, we know the Hertz frequencies that apneic events occur at. It does not add up numbers though. Remember the pulse oximeter said you're a uh, what was it, 33. You had 33 apneic events. This doesn't do that. This just says from a quality standpoint, you weren't sleeping well, and one of the explanations might be apnea because it happened quite frequently last night. Right? Two different kinds of low frequency events. One is called broadband, that's fragmented sleep. The other one, and they actually denote it by this big broad band of red. And the other one is narrow band. Narrow band is things that occur with periodicity. Central sleep apnea is one that is most common. Central sleep apnea, remember, is this, the apneic event where you don't try to breathe. Your body is recalibrating itself. Periodic, periodic limb movements would be the other one, and it will highlight that for you. It also tells you, are they laying on the back, on their side? You can see patterns, like when you roll on your left side, you sleep great. That kind of thing can be denoted from this. The next thing that it's going to show you is actigraphy, which is movement. We already know that if you're moving, you're not sleeping well. The more you move, the less quality of sleep that you're actually going to have. And finally, there's a snoring index that can be obtained off this. And you can even see, like in this one, they were snoring like a banshee, but they were actually getting stable sleep during it. We would define that as being benign snoring. They get the advantage of being asleep even though they are snoring. Okay? It follows crescendo snoring as well. So who do I use this particular device on? Kids down to the age of six months and anyone that I suspect has upper airway resistance syndrome, my TMD patient. It's measuring heart rate variability, which in fact in the TMD literature is something that is a biomarker for the TMD patient. So two different devices in my office, both are screening, not studies. One to look at fat old men with apnea, one to look for young fit female and children and the impact that they're having, all right? I can't stand to hear much more of her, by the way. Um, I have had, so we've been doing this a long time in the office. Um, 
I have had two patients that have declined to take a device with them when we offered it. Now, I've had a boatload of patients that got it home and didn't use it, all right? And eventually, we had to get it back from them. Like, are you gonna use this or not? Because we need, we gotta have somebody else do it. And by the way, if you start doing it, make an appointment for them to return it. That's something we learned the hard way. We had a guy who took it out and returned it one year later. So we kept calling him like, we need this, we need this, all right? So if you took it with you, we would say, okay, how about Thursday at three, you bring it back. So it's a real appointment on our books. All right, that lady, by the way, was one of them. The other one was my hygienist who's a myofunctional therapist as well, so she's very into this. She came back to me and said, You're not, you won't believe what he just told me. And I said, what? He said, if I want to learn about my airway and sleep, I'll ask my physician. And I said, that's fine. Let him die. So, you know, you can't save everyone, so just move on. The other one was the lady that was snoring. So I got to talking to her and I said, you know, a lot of the things I'm seeing on your teeth and all the damage and the reason we're having to do this dentistry may be related to airway. And she said, I don't have that problem. I'm like, well, I know, you know, a lot of people don't believe they have the problem, but we offer this screening and blah, blah, blah. So we go on and on and she goes, look, are you going to work on my teeth or are we going to talk about my sleep? And I go, oh, no, we're cutting on your teeth. And so I just, I made her an appointment. We sedated her. And then she started snoring like that. Well, when she's snoring, she's desaturating, and I'm having to prep her teeth and hold her mandible forward to keep her airway open the whole time, because heaven forbid I stop prepping, right? So I'm like manipulating her at the same time to keep the thing open, and finally I got tired. And I just go, I gotta take a break. And then she went like that, turned to her side and started snoring. So I went and video. Spike. But, <laughs> I mean, so I had to admit, at its core, it was spike. But what did it do? At the one week visit we always have with our patients, looking at their occlusion, the aesthetics, and all, I said, you know, and oh, by the way, here's you. So she was embarrassed, yes? She said, I guess I do have that problem. And so she went out and got a sleep about me. She went down to CPAP, she failed CPAP, she tried an oral appliance, she failed that. She went to an ENT and she got her nose fixed. And when she got her nose fixed, then she didn't have that issue anymore. So it's just an evolution of whatever, you know, whatever the screening device happens to be, right? Could be a video, could be audio, whatever it happens to be. And that, a lot of the apps are measuring like audio. There's a snore app that's out there. You go, oh, you know, I don't think I have that problem. Okay, try the snore app. Okay, that, you know, I do have that problem, right? It's pretty simple. All right. All right. I love when I can use both of these at the same time because it really gives me some answers. And it's not often that I have both of them in the office at the same time or a person that would actually physically wear both of them. But think about what it does. One of them is telling me that it's an apneic event and it's showing me what the pulse rate is doing. And the other one is actually showing me the effect of it. So this was a guy that in one of our courses where I did both of them. He happened to have apnea and be on CPAP, but he didn't feel good and he was thinking about going through maximal mandibular advancement because of it. So he had a pretty significant apnea, but on the CPAP, how is his apnea? Remember that's the far left-hand column. His AHI is two, his, R, his rear is are one for an RDI of three. How's that? That's pretty darn good, isn't it? I mean, it's really good. So you look at page three of the report, and does he desaturate? Hardly at all. But what is his pulse doing? And it doesn't look quiet, does it? It looks like it's constantly being activated. Now it's not a lot, but it's still, it's constantly active. So if all I did from the screening standpoint was do this test, or he had gone in to the sleep laboratory and done another sleep study, or if we just called up his CPAP machine and asked him for how's the apnea doing, what would we say? It's doing great, right? You're welcome. The other asked a different question. 
How are you sleeping? How's the quality of your sleep? And when we look at quality of sleep, how's he doing? Didn't get any quality at all. So remember, there are two different events that cause harm. One is that you're having all this apneic event and it's creating inflammation. And the other is you're not getting the benefit of being asleep. This guy doesn't have apnea, but he's constantly active. So he's creating a chronic stress in his system, but more importantly, he's getting no value of being asleep. That's why he still wakes up and he feels lousy. All right. Next area. Next area is medical impacts. So we're going to spend very little time talking about the actual medical impact of this. This is more for the sleep course that we do. I'm going to look at some of the reasons why those things happen. As I said, excessive daytime sleepiness is probably the, the worst of the issues because it affects not only the person going through it, but the rest of us as well. We also said that it creates inflammation. So for this section, kind of divided it up into the apnea patient, the UARS patient, and the kid, all three of the different groups. So as far as inflammation in the apnea patient, Using C-reactive proteins as our marker for inflammation, what it found is the worse the apnea, the higher the level of inflammation. So there is a relationship between them. Next study is on UARS patients. It says that just intermittent hypoxias, or my more UARS type of activity all night long, can create inflammation. And finally, in kids, the same thing. Kids can have inflammation that mimics what goes on in an adult. Probably my favorite study looking at that is this particular one, where they got a bunch of kids that needed their tonsils and adenoids removed. And all the kids before the removal of the tonsils and adenoids went through a sleep study. So, a bunch of kids, tonsil and adenoids need to be removed. Everyone now has a sleep study. So how can we group the kids? We can now divide them into kids with apnea, kids without apnea. Right? They go through and get the tonsils and adenoids removed. They take the tonsils and actually section the tonsils and look at the immune response of the body. In the kids that had normal airways with big infected tonsils, they got a normal immune response. In the kids with big tonsils and an airway issue, they got an altered immune response. So the body reacts in an irregular manner when in the presence of poor breathing. So tomorrow we're going to be talking about periodontal disease. And periodontal disease is bacterially derived, but it deals with the host response to the bacteria. And in fact, since 2010, a significant amount of studies in the world of perio have pointed to the fact that patients that have airway issues, and the airway issue can be as minor as mouth breathing, are more prone to periodontal disease, and they do not heal as well during intervention, be it scaling or root planing, surgery, whatever it happens to be. And it's simply because their inflammatory response is so off. The next area is actually how it activates the autonomic nervous system and the HPA axis, and that's where we'll start right after lunch. So, Jen, you're going to come up and tell them what to do for lunch? All right, everybody, I have literally just a couple of things, but they're really important. If you signed up for the